Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Contract Packaging Association's webinar on contingency plan response, helping business leaders and organizations to adapt and thrive in the face of uncertainty. I am Ron Puvak, the Managing Director of CPA. Since 1992, CPA has been promoting the growth and welfare of members through its industry exposure and networking programs. CPA members are comprised of the nation's leading contract packagers, manufacturers, perform all types of manufacturing and packaging functions for their brands. Uh, Ryan, would you go ahead and advance the first slide, please? We've been the voice of the industry since 1992. Uh, we serve the needs of the industry through continuing education, market knowledge, customer relationships, one of our key components is our, is our, and our mission is education. Today's webinar is an ongoing commitment to the inform the industry uh, on innovation as well as to stimulate the audience. All of you currently are in mute. You will, uh, you will have any, if you have any questions, please use the question box and we will respond as many as you can. We may also solicit feedback via electronic link. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the CPA website at contract packaging.org and we will follow up with a short survey after the webinar we please ask you to take the survey and give us your feedback plus we have some other opportunities that we'd like to get your feedback on today's presenters are ryan weiss who's the president of effective performance strategies and dr dave nykamp a licensed clinical psychologist working in the field of organizational development and leadership design gentlemen Please take it away and thank you. So thank you very much for the introduction, Ron, and uh, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you all here. Uh, just a bit of background on Dr. Dave and myself. Uh, I've been in the packaging industry for over 20 years. I worked in uh, the adhesives industry for uh, national adhesives and Henkel adhesives for about 17 years. In the past four years, uh, went out on my own and started Effective Performance Strategies. Um, I've moved uh, seven times in 17 years, including to Asia and back two times. I uh, ran a shared service center organization, uh, the head of North America operations for Henkel in the Philippines for, uh, for almost three years. And, uh, and in that role also was global head of continuous improvement. So had some, uh, some work and some responsibility working with contract manufacturers and, um, and, uh, and contract packagers on our branded side of the business, uh, but also was uh, responsible uh, primarily in the adhesives business. So did a lot of work in folding carton, flexible packaging and different parts of, uh, of the packaging industry. But uh, my primary focus over my career has always been on uh, process improvement and helping organizations to make improvements. One of those things when we were in the Philippines, uh, we didn't just do contingency planning and, uh, um, and look at plans, but we actually had to implement on what we called our business continuity plan a number of times. In the Philippines, they have uh, everything from volcanoes uh, to earthquakes uh, to disease. I, I got the mumps while I was there, even though I was vaccinated as a child. Uh, you know, and we had uh, hurricanes, they called them typhoons that came through and flooding due to poor infrastructure. Uh, and we were in one of the tallest buildings in downtown Makati. So, uh, so we actually spent a lot of time doing contingency planning and, um, and executing on it. Uh, there were times when we were putting uh, employees in hotel rooms to get internet access and, uh, and to make sure that we were uh, continuing the, uh, the business as it needed to be uh, to be continued. And so that's part of my background in terms of uh, contingency planning and this contingency plan response uh, program that we put together that we're going to share with you some uh, key points about uh, the impact in the packaging industry and also hope to get sort of a roundtable discussion with some questions and comments from those of you on the line. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dave if you can introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I'll just be brief. Again, my name is David Niekamp. I'm a licensed clinical psychology. I look at the question of why we do what we do. I've entered the world through the world of clinical psychology with that question, and I've translated that into why we do what we do at work. Uh, your customers, your employees, all of these are people, and without people, you don't have a business, you don't have customers. 
So that's my focus. I like to say I'm a reformed musician, um, and I study, born of that background, I study patterns and subsequently systems and disruptions in those systems. And that's what brings Ryan and I together, is collectively or collaborating on how to identify accurately, define them, and rectify them so your system or organizations can be productive. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Dave. So uh, I've got just a couple of slides here. Uh, it, the, that agenda we had up on the screen at the beginning about why EPS, why effective performance strategies, um, just talk through very briefly what our organization does. Uh, over the past four years, I've led about 70 lean events, um, and not just uh, in terms of doing an event, but uh, training events, facilitating and training folks in primarily in the packaging food service industry, uh, aluminum, paperboard, uh, plastics, and, uh, and, and packaging food service uh, were, were primary target markets. And, uh, and so working with uh, large to mid and, and smaller companies in, uh, in helping them and, and uh, making sure that we're doing the right things and uh, doing things in the most efficient and effective way possible. My background, if you saw in, in the previous slide, was uh, I've, I've started four companies. I've founded four companies in my life. One of them when I was 16 years old. It's still run by my youngest brother today, and uh, he's turned it into much more successful business than I ever envisioned at the time. Uh, but this is one of my passions, is, uh, is helping organizations and helping leaders to uh, facilitate and, and grow. So we've done a lot of these uh, setup reduction type events. So uh, change over times, how to rapidly and efficiently change a machine from one product to another. In some cases, there's significant savings in terms of dollar value. In other cases, it's much more about the flexibility to, uh, to be able to change rapidly between products and, uh, and generate capacity. And I think in the contract packaging world and the contract manufacturing world, that, uh, that flexibility to adapt and to move between products becomes a very important part of what you do and how you operate. And, uh, and so this is a, one of the types of projects that we do a, a lot of. And uh, some of this is going on site and facilitating these types of events and training folks on how to do it. And, uh, and other times we, well, one of the things in recent history is we're moving more and more towards uh, the virtual setting. And, We've created uh, training templates and customizable templates to, uh, to help deliver and to coach a lot more effectively without being on site. We also have done a, quite a few of these total productive maintenance events, and um, these don't typically have as high of, high of an ROI for, for clients, but it's really about uh, making sure your equipment is in a productive state. And, that, that doesn't just mean that the equipment is functioning as it should. It's not just about oil changes, but it's about productivity and making sure that uh, you're focused on not just the machine itself, but also the process of how you work with the machine. It's not just about going to Jiffy Lube and changing the oil, but it's also about riding with the driver, right? I've got a couple of 18-year-old children uh, that just went through the driving lessons a couple of years ago and uh, sitting in the car next to them and seeing them brake very fast at stop signs, for example, uh, often leads to uh, the brakes wearing out faster. So those are things you wouldn't typically see in an oil change, but when you're doing total productive maintenance, it's much more about the equipment and the process of how you work with it. Also worked on uh, quite a few of these quality events. Quality events are typically not focused on a hard dollar value, but in some cases they're much more focused on looking at uh, saving a customer or uh, being able to explain uh, or, or uh, drive improved quality to improve the customer experience. And, uh, and so we've done a number of these events in terms of facilitation and, and driving uh, for performance with organizations. So we also look at, uh, you know, kind of where we're at today, right? This sort of brings us to this unemployment and the cultural change that's happening in, uh, in America and globally today. Um, I'm looking back over my 25 or so years of experience in industry and, and thinking about sort of the, uh, 
you know, I've got the unemployment rate chart up here, but thinking about the dot-com euphoria that, uh, that burst, right? The, the dot-com bubble burst, but it was very transformative in terms of culture, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, the way we absorb information. My grandmother used to have a full set of encyclopedias and I once lost one of her encyclopedias when I took it to school and got in trouble for it, very memorable. But since the dot-com bubble, um, there's been a cultural change in terms of how we absorb information. September 11th, before September 11th, I used to uh, sit on small regional commuter jets and be able to see the pilots and their, and their panel in the, uh, in the cockpit. And, uh, and we're not seeing that anymore. It changed the way that we travel as a culture. The financial crisis in, uh, in 08 and 09 um, really transformed the way we look at uh, the financial industry and real estate and, uh, and, and loaning money and borrowing money. Um, and, and now that brings us to today, the, uh, the you know, sort of unprecedented crisis in terms of what we've seen and what we've observed around uh, this pandemic. Uh, and, and it's not just about the unemployment rate. There are cultural changes that are happening um, the acceptance of people wearing masks in public, for example, the, uh, the view of supply chain around, uh, we see companies like Tyson Foods and uh, Smithfield Foods needing to shut down plants to, uh, to make sure that they're doing the right things and that the, their employees aren't all getting infected. Um, we see my, a couple of my children work at a supermarket and uh, the, the plexiglass and the mask wearing and and the acceptance of these things that when I lived in Asia for almost five years, we normally and commonly see people walking around with masks on. But uh, coming back to the United States, it's something you almost never saw up until a, a few months ago. And, uh, and we started seeing that much more regularly. I'll, I'll also ask Dr. Dave maybe to comment. There was a thing on his profile earlier. A few months ago, he wrote a white paper about kinetic anxiety. And, uh, and, you know, kind of thinking about the more recent events of rioting and looting and things like that and how those things might be related. So, Dr. Dave, if you could comment on that for a moment. Yeah, kinetic anxiety is a pent up unresolved fear. Uh, when I talk, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so this is just a primer. There's fear that's real and fear that's perceived. And that leads to a fight, flight or freeze syndrome. We'll talk a little bit about that. But in order to grow and develop, uh, we must all take risks, as the slide indicates, and Ryan will say more about that. But the kinetic anxiety is when it's all pent up and it builds kinetic energy so that once it's triggered, it can just explode. And this is what we're seeing with respect to the rioting in the streets uh, nationally. Uh, we can avoid that. And th that's clearly a disruption. And uh, we want to uh, take those disruptions or avoid them as we can and redirect that energy elsewhere to be productive. Yeah. So thanks, Dr. Dave. And one of, one of the things that we observe, right, in terms of how people are reacting to risk is how consumer behaviors changed. On March 13th, I was driving back from a, a client, a, actually a packaging company in the Cincinnati area, back to my home in western Chicago suburbs. And, uh, and I was listening to the news and I was listening to uh, I actually heard some things about how alcohol sales were had had started spiking, right? And that uh, and ammunition and and gun sales were spiking. And there's a a Cabela's shop on the uh, on the route. And I pulled off and I I went inside just to take a look. I didn't buy anything, but the parking lot was full at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And uh, and as I went in and walked around, the gun counter was full of people and. Uh, people were looking at and buying ammunition. So there are clearly people who jump into that fight mode and, uh, and that's evidenced in, in consumer behaviors. The freeze mode that Dr. Dave talked about of um, you know, alcohol sales in April jumped by about 70%. Um, the people are freezing and, uh, and, and freezing in place. And then there were people who went into flight mode and uh, looking at the, uh, the toilet paper industry and the empty store shelves of, of toilet paper of people saying, I'm going to stay home for a long time. I need to buy these things. So there are, there are certain dynamics going on in, in our culture and in the, the mindset of how things are changing 
that uh, that will change packaging. In fact, Dr. Dave and I first met about six months ago at a uh, a flavoring company here in Geneva, Illinois, and uh, and we've continued and developed our relationship over time. But we were just there again this morning, and uh, and the uh, the owner of this company was talking about the uh, the the increase in sales that they've seen, the increase in sales that they've experienced as a result of people consumers shopping in the middle of the supermarket again. So uh, so this leads us sort of to this framework for contingency plan response, those steps that you can take to uh, to recognize that you have a problem, to stop and, and view that I have a problem, to then move into a plan, right? How am I going to plan? How am I going to move forward? And then we need to get back to adapting. We're gonna adapt our business, whether it's putting up plexiglass or it's uh, putting in place uh, using uh, infrared temperature scanners for, uh, for all the employees coming to our shop or uh, having actually infrared cameras out front and making sure that people are coming in and, uh, and they're healthy, right? There are things that are happening culturally in our, in our society that, uh, that are kind of moving through these steps that we need to recognize we have a problem, create a plan, adapt and then uh, and then get back to those sort of blue skies and uh, and blue ocean that we were experiencing before so one of the things that can happen is sort of this financial prioritization that uh, as business leaders as uh, as organizations we need to think about things like uh, cash flow and income and equity and i like to think about these from my mba and finance days where um where we talk about these uh these three different ways of measuring uh, finances and, and the health of a business that cash flow is really like oxygen that if i'm getting up every morning and the first thing i'm doing is checking the the cash in my bank account to make sure i can make payroll we're, i'm going to make different decisions than uh, than if i'm if I have plenty of oxygen to uh, to survive and plenty of water to drink, and I'm really just looking at building equity, and I'm eating uh, cheeseburgers or maybe even steak, and uh, and so there are different places that we may be in as business leaders and business owners um, in terms of you know are we are we breathing oxygen? Are we uh, needing water to drink, or are we uh, are we really uh, in a place where we're building equity? So when we talk about prioritization and we talk about clarity around prioritization, there are risks that we may need to stop and recognize. There, are, there may be changing market conditions. So uh, we've already talked about a few of those things in, in the packaging market. Uh, there could be supply chain disruptions, things like uh, Tyson Foods and Smithfield Foods that we've, that we've observed. There may be credit availability. There, uh, you know, Back in the financial crisis, that was the uh, the biggest risk for most or for many organizations. Uh, loss of key personnel. One of the examples here may not just be long term loss of personnel, but also short term. That packaging company in Cincinnati that I was driving back from in the month of April, they had 35 percent of their employees not show up for work. So loss of key personnel can be another area of prioritization. Safety and security breach, the flavorings company was talking this morning, uh, the CEO was talking about um, how safety and security has changed and how as leaders and business leaders, uh, we need to lead by example in terms of uh, safety and security. Also things like physical assets or legal liabilities. So as a business leader, as a business owner, prioritization becomes one of the, uh, one of the most important things. But it's not just about you prioritizing in your office alone. There's a prioritization process that's really important and really effective to, uh, to make an impact, to prioritize with your team, to include them, uh, not just to say, I'm going to prioritize and tell them what my priorities are, but when you include your team, when you include other team members in prioritization, it starts to enhance accountability and enhance buy-in from those people. But you need to really clearly identify what are your priorities and what are those risks and how do you define those as an organization? So this becomes a really important part of, uh, of contingency planning and contingency responses. 
So we'll also talk just a bit about uh, sort of habits, right? Uh, if we go back before March 13th, if we go back to maybe January or February and think about the habits that we had, the uh, and habits I define as people and process, the way the individual interacts with the processes around them. You may have gotten up in the morning and grabbed your Starbucks coffee and gone to the office and opened your laptop and read your emails and you had some sequence of habits throughout the day, but that all changed. And in that change, in that disruption, it's really important to consider what's my purpose, right? Why, why does our organization exist? Why do I feel this is important? When habits are changing and being disrupted, this is the single most important point at which you can change for the better. And one of the examples that, uh, that we give of this, uh, about eight months ago, I was approached by one of the large chemical companies and they asked me to modernize the training within the industry program of the US government in the 1940s. And I thought it was an odd request at the time, but I started researching about Rosie the Riveter and started researching about uh, the, the dynamics that happened in, um, in you know, World War II was going on and women were coming into the workforce at the, in the first time, at, for the first time um, into technical jobs. And, uh, and the way the dynamics changed in terms of the purpose, right? That we need to win this, right? We need you to, uh, to be part of this. And the messaging that went on around Rosie the Riveter was a very clear and very powerful message around purpose. And the people, people were changing. People's habits had been disrupted. And we also, that also brings us to process. So the thing that I focus on the most is really around process, but I've come to appreciate over the past 20 years how absolutely critical it is to understand the purpose and the people if we're going to change those habits, if we're going to improve performance, all three of these need to work together in a very powerful way. And this is exactly why I mentioned in prioritization, you need to make sure that you're including the right people when you're doing that prioritization, not just doing it in isolation. And that starts leading us to sort of a mitigation plan. So thinking about things like key milestones, how am I going to manage projects? How am I going to manage through this? As your org some of you may have been you know, slow during this period, some of you may have been going, uh, going crazy with lots and lots of work because Customers are buying uh, consumable products in packages. Um, but as, uh, as we're going through the, uh, the COVID and now the, uh, um, the, the pent up anxiety that Dr. Dave talked about and moving towards, you know, we have rioting and things going on, um, we need to be putting those mitigation plans into place with some key milestones and action plans and developing a communication plan. So this is sort of the uh, the framework as we uh, as we go through this. So we'll, we'll just we've got a couple more slides here, and then we're going to get into some more interactive uh, discussion and, and roundtable discussion. Uh, one of the things you want to think about in terms of the context and where your organization is at today, and where your organization wants to get to. We could think about the example of changing a tire on the side of the road. And, and you're, when you're changing a tire on the side of the road, uh, you've got a lot of problems, right? It's, it's not a very efficient process. It might take me 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes, and I may make some mistakes. I may jack the car up and then try to loosen the, the lug nuts and realize that I can't do that, and I need to lower the car again so the tire's in contact with the ground. Um, so we think about the context of changing a tire on the side of the road and the pain that we experience, but we can also think about an auto mechanic at that Firestone dealership or at a Jiffy Lube or at um, where they're changing tires in a car. It's a different context for the same task or a Formula One race team on the racetrack. If we think about these three contexts and three scenarios, uh, we have different tools. Right, the, on the side of the road, I've got sort of that wobbly wrench that, uh, that I'm using to jack up the car and I've got uh, you know, difficulty with the, the lug nut wrench that I've got there. 
But if I went to the auto mechanic, they've got better tools. They've got air compressors and they've got, they've got decent tools. But the Formula One race team has outstanding tools, right? They have the best tools that you can possibly have to, uh, to do this job. The second one is the skills. When I'm stuck on the side of the road, I changed, I've changed about four tires in my entire life uh, in 40 years. I don't do it very often. The auto mechanic does it daily. The pit crew trains for it, right? They actually train for it and they look to perf make perfection. And finally, it's mindset. If I'm stuck on the side of the road and I'm ticked off and I'm not happy because I'm late getting to a customer or I'm late getting home for dinner, I'm not all that excited about it. But the Formula One pit crew, they're pumped up. Their goal is to hit one and a half seconds or two seconds. The auto mechanic, I kind of put as neutral, right? They, they're there, it's their job, it's what they do. So I'd like you, all of you to sort of reflect and think about where is your organization at today? Where are you at today in terms of moving through this process of getting to where you're gonna adapt and restart your business and get back to where you're smooth sailing again? It, are you stuck because you don't have the right tools or your team is missing some tools? Are you stuck because of skills or is it mindset? And this can be a really challenging and really uh, sort of painful thing to think about and to, uh, and to ask. And finally, um, this kind of moves us towards adapting. With our organization, we need to execute, right? We need to have some open communication and drive commitment and accountability for the people on our team. My brother is, a, uh, is the director for the uh, water department in the city of Elgin. And uh, at the very beginning of this, he, uh, he started to freeze with indecision. That he had so many decisions to make about making sure he had 90 days of chemical on all of, at all of his facilities and all of these types of things running through his brain. And, uh, and it became very difficult to make decisions. Um, and, and so we talked through some of these things around having open communication with his team, thinking about those underutilized resources you have on your teams and making sure that you're prioritizing together, not prioritizing in your, in your own office, but that helps you to drive commitment and accountability with your team. And finally, you can do innovation. Sometimes uh, necessity, they say, is the mother of in invention. And, uh, and we've seen quite a variety of innovations happening over the past couple of months as, uh, as we've been going through this, that we see uh, microbreweries that are, are making, uh, switching over to making hand sanitizer. We see organizations that are pushing and pushing their uh, mobile apps to order food so that there's less contact between the consumer and the people producing. So I'd encourage all of you to think about in the context of your business, not just getting back to normal, not just getting back to life as it was, but also the opportunity for innovation. And I understand in, in contract packaging and contract manufacturing, there's a lot of opportunity um, in terms of you know, hand sanitizer market that's, uh, that's kind of exploded, right? Or, um, or, or things like that, that, uh, that may be enabling your organization to, uh, to drive and to, to thrive as you move forward. So as we, uh, as we kind of transition into this roundtable facilitation, I'd like to first open up if there are questions, if people have, uh, you know, have any questions about what we've discussed so far. And, uh, and if not, then we can go into some, uh, some questions that we can uh, put out there to get you thinking and to, uh, and, and to maybe facilitate some of the discussion. So I'll see if, has anybody put any, uh, if you have any chat questions, you're welcome to, uh, to put them in here. Uh, we have one question, Ryan. Okay. Uh, the question is, what are you seeing as some of the most common issues currently, and what are your recommendations to solve them? Yeah, so, I, so and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Dave first in terms of uh, he's you know, seen some anxiety and some of those things and maybe give some tools around that and then I'll, and I'll 
um, comment more directly to you uh, to packaging. So, Dr. Dave, do you have any sure. uh, comments? Let's harken back to the uh, real and perceived uh, note of fear. I'm seeing a lot of uh, that uh, present itself. And as a reference point for the audience, a perceived threat is most notably re recognized with post traumatic stress disorder where they're originated with a real threat, but is activated by a perceived threat much later. People do this as well as organizations. And I've, the organizations that I have uh, the uh, pleasure of working with are experiencing some of this. And the conversations that we have to have are uh, a point of de definition and, and clarity, specifically around is this a real threat and is it a, or is it a perceived threat? Now, these are not dichotomously polarized you can have an element of both. The cost to define this is time from a manufacturing perspective, and the benefit is increased efficiency. If you take the time to clearly define, is it real or is it perceived and what combination, albeit that's a cost of time, if you're able to clarify that, you can then engage in roundtable discussions, you can identify what needs to be uh, internalized via the purpose or the commitment, what needs to be measured in terms of the accountability, and then move forward together. Uh, uh, on the note of fear and real and perceived, we have the fight, flight, or freeze. Really what we want to do is we want to seize the opportunity, but we must do together. Uh, a catchphrase that Ron and I have uh, come to is, there's no way out but through, and the only way through is together. Uh, the first inclination is for us to hold up and protect and become selfish in, in blunt terms. But to do so isolates us and further prevents us from growing and becoming more efficient and discussing with others what we actually need to do. So I would suggest that you collect yourselves, those that you trust, those that you uh, know will give you feedback that's honest but not brutal, and ultimately come to a conclusion that is productive for your organizations, whether at the micro level or at the macro. That's what happened with Rosie the Riveter in World War II. Yeah, so thank, thank you for that, Dr. Dave. So, the, um, so one of the things I'll, I'll sort of open up and then I'll answer this, this question. Um, for any of you who are on the call, who can, if you can go on your cell phone to uh, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and it's gonna ask you to put in a code and you just put in the six digit code that's up there at the top of the screen, 12, 29, 24. This is completely confidential. So, so we're not asking, it's not recording anything. Uh, you don't have to download an app or anything like that. You can also do it on your computer if you'd like. Uh, but if you go there and we've got a couple of questions here that I think will help facilitate some of the discussion. But so Ron, to the question that you asked, um, you know, I think the, the three, I, I wrote down a couple notes here while Dr. Dave was speaking. I think the three things I've seen in terms of packaging, uh, in terms of problems are, uh, I would say personnel issues. So I alluded to the, uh, the attendance issue uh, for that client in Cincinnati that uh, it wasn't just them. They're, they're part of a large organization and there were other sites that they had pretty significant attendance issues. Um, not because people had gotten COVID, but because people were afraid of getting it. And, uh, and so people weren't coming to work. So I think uh, attendance was one of, the, uh, one of the really big things. I think the second piece of that is the anxiety. Um, I've, I've talked to some business leaders who are really struggling with the, that fight, flight, or freeze that their team is in and, uh, and struggling with communicating and, and clearly communicating with their employees. And so I think those, uh, those two things are really important, are really critical um, to make sure you're communicating and make sure you're listening to what the employees are telling you. Uh, this, this Mentimeter tool is something that I've used in a variety of, of scenarios, a variety of settings. Uh, actually used this with an, the big aluminum company when we were going through and they were changing their uh, medical plan. And, uh, and we use this as an anonymous way to facilitate groups of people to, uh, to be able to get feedback about, the, uh, about things that sometimes those silent people 
sometimes those frozen people who aren't moving very fast or who are frozen with indecision uh, to get their feedback because they may not always be outspoken in a uh, um, in a in a setting. So. Um, so that's one way to uh, to make sure you're connecting with your employees and communicating with them. Make sure that you understand where they're at. Um, you want to meet your employees where they're at. Are they um, are they in that fight mode? Are they are they running away or are they frozen with uh, with indecision? And uh, and making sure you clarify that. The second area I see in terms of packaging, there have been some supply chain disruptions and. Uh, some of those, fortunately, have been pretty short-term spikes, but um, but some of the supply chain disruptions have uh, have created some uh, created some havoc, but they've always also created some opportunity. So I mentioned some of the meat packing plants earlier, right? We used to sell a lot of adhesives into those uh, into those facilities, uh, but I'm also involved with some farm-to-table companies and and looking at the direct to consumer models, there's some innovation going on. There are farmers who are coming together and, uh, and processing the hogs that, uh, that they're being told to slaughter. And, uh, and they're putting up uh, small processing facilities to adapt. And I think this is, uh, this is one of the ways for you to look at it. And the third area is demand. Um, I think in packaging, um, I don't think that overall there's been a decline in demand, but I think what we're seeing is more of a shift in demand. And uh, right, so so the flexibility as a packaging company to be able to adapt and to be able to utilize your equipment in ways that you can uh, move between bottling certain things or um, or creating uh, cartons for certain types of, uh, of, of goods, those types of things, having that flexibility to adapt, is is absolutely critical in terms of uh, in terms of moving forward. So, Ron, does that answer the question that uh, that you asked? Yeah, I think it is. That came from one of our audience members. There's another yeah. one here, um, and it has to do with I think the fourth step process was monitoring. I don't think we talked in great detail about that. And the question kind of is, you know, where do you develop the things you monitor? And what are the metrics and where do you develop those metrics if you are monitoring so in the, in the process right great great question and um yeah so we didn't uh, we didn't focus as much on that because we're kind of uh, kind of coming out of this but absolutely that's the that's the key to that fourth step of monitoring and um you know i have i have some very strong opinions and beliefs about metrics and uh and how people react to metrics and and they move forward with them. And uh, in one of those examples, when I moved to the Philippines, the uh, I I had 180 people with computers looking at me. And on day one, I really wasn't quite sure even what all of them did. Um, I had worked for the organization for for dec a decade at that point, um, but I, I wasn't that familiar with the specific tasks of what the people were doing. And uh, and what we developed was. A, uh, was three core metrics for each of the teams. We had eight teams, and uh, and I asked each of the managers to put up three key metrics on a on a very common uh, bulletin board that was right outside of my office. And I asked them to all come and update on a monthly basis what those metrics were, and um, and have a, a small team meeting around that bulletin board. And that sounds sort of uh, that, that maybe sounds more like the 1940s than, than 2016, but, but in reality, the, uh, the, there's a lot of power in, in terms of having metrics be very visible and have them be manually updated. The attention that people pay to those metrics is really important. But to your question, uh, Ron, about how to pick those metrics, um, I actually had the managers uh, identify those metrics. We had a huge, a massive database of metrics for all kinds of financial and supply chain metrics. But I asked my, my managers to uh, develop for their team three key metrics, one around quality, one around productivity, and one around value. And, uh, and there was a lot of resistance. It took us uh, probably a year, a year and a half to get to where everybody was, was consistently doing this and had metrics in mind. 
And I chose those three, um, those three categories for a reason. Um, that is, I wanted to see the metrics in those categories improve. And, but I put it on the managers, the, the people closer to the process, to come back to me with which were the right metrics for their department, for their group. And, and the reason becomes ownership. The thing we talked about earlier, that when they developed, when they came back to me and said, these are the three metrics we're going to improve, their team was passionate about improving those three metrics. I didn't have to go out of my office and, and monitor those three metrics every day. Their teams were the ones who wanted to improve them because the other teams in the, in the office were able to see and, and visibly, you know, kind of, it, it created some, a little bit of competition without making it official. And, uh, and, and so I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, importance to having the people who are doing the process having the people who are managing the process uh, set those metrics in line with what's important. Because at the end of the year, if they pick the wrong metric and, uh, and, and they continue having problems all year long and they're not making progress, then, then there's some accountability uh, to them. So that's sort of the monitoring process, right? Is I would encourage people to think about a framework and think about engaging folks because our, our company spent an enormous amount of money uh, doing all kinds of electronic things around the uh, around what you know a data cube, if you will, and, uh, and and but the impact and the power of changing people's habits is is really what you don't want to uh, don't want to lose. So great uh, great questions there. Yeah, to add to, to add to that, Ryan, uh, automation is part of our life, but it is not part of our it is not culture in and of itself, and it's culture that's really going to uh, from which we draw what metrics do we really need to attend to. And the people on the front lines, your managers, your line workers, they're the ones who are going to be best informed to, to tell you. And you have to have a really good culture uh, to solicit that rich information. It will cost you time, but in the end, it'll make the process far more accurate and efficient. Great, great comments. Are there any other questions, Ron, or we'll keep uh, kind of moving on here? Just go ahead and keep moving on, and if there's another more pop up, I'll get I'll get them in. Fantastic. So, uh, all right. So, I appreciate the uh, the input here from uh, you know kind of what you're looking forward to. Uh, no more masks and travel and camaraderie, and um, I think I think probably all of us can uh, can resonate with uh, with some of these comments. So, I appreciate these uh, these comments that you all have put up here, and uh, and we're going to ask a couple other. Um, a couple other questions that I'd like to hopefully prompt some discussion with. So if you if you uh, sort of think about the question, how has COVID how has COVID impacted your stakeholders? So each of us in our lives has uh, sort of employees and friends and family and customers and suppliers. Um, would you say that COVID this this whole situation has had a huge impact or a minimal impact? So we'll give you just a moment to. Um, to answer this question, if you uh, if you're following along on your phone or, or laptop, um, if you need to still join menti.com and put in that uh, six-digit code. I'll hide the results. There's, I probably should have hidden them earlier. Hide the results so people can respond here quickly and get a few uh, get a few results in here. While we're waiting on that, on the note of metrics and the like and automation, information is important and relevant, but it's in and of itself is flat unless it's applied and it's only applied through the culture and the people in which you're operating, with whom you're operating. Okay. So data is helpful, but it's, it's in and of itself irrelevant unless it's effectively understood, applied, integrated, and subsequently uh, learned. Great, uh, great point, Dr. Dave. Uh, Ryan, oh, go ahead. Ryan. Yes, sir. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you had an example at the beginning. Someone had has brought this up. Uh, of your brother had multiple multiple problems. Right. You know, many many problems. Uh, what's been your experience? How people can relate to multiple problems? What do they normally boil down to? What's the, you know, top two, top three? I know there's prioritization. 
Sure. But if you have seven problems, you're not going to attack them all at once. What has been your experience of how people kind of get to this, you know, smaller list or attack? Right. Yeah. Great. Great question. And so this is um, actually there's some uh, there's some symbolism in the uh, in the logo that we use. Right. Um, you've got the kind of the stop sign. Right. Is the red color. A yield sign is yellow or orange. Uh, you've got a green uh, circle is go, and and the blue kind of parallelogram is is sort of uh, is, is sort of monitoring and um, and accelerating or moving forward. Um, and and the reason that, uh, that I think this is relevant to the uh, to the question here is that if you think about a stop sign, there's uh, there's eight points there, and one of the things that Dr. Dave and I have talked about a number of times and uh, is when, when the human mind, so I'll, Dr. Dave, if you want to uh, give any technical stuff here, but the human mind can't think about too many things at once, right? We actually need to be very focused. The, the stop sign has eight points on it. And the way I view this is sometimes we feel overwhelmed and we, and we are overwhelmed because we feel that um, there's just, there's so many things coming at us that we just don't know what to do next. And, uh, and, and that's the symbolism of this stop sign, that we need to stop, we need to recognize that that's where we're at. And then we move towards the yield sign, which is the second uh, step in this process, the yield sign uh, having three points, that if you can make some priorities and you can, with your team, create three key points, three key priorities of where you're going to go and, and how you're gonna get there, then, then you could be much more effective. And this is actually part of the reason that when I was in the Philippines and we had, I gave them uh, quality, productivity, and value as their three metrics I wanted to see, was that people can't concentrate on eight points or 16 points or 100 points, but they can concentrate on three. And, uh, and the human mind seems much more capable of, of doing that. And, uh, and that then when you get to the green circle, right, you have a single point, you can delegate and start uh, start moving that responsibility out in a way that people can be focused and they can actually take action. And uh, so, so appreciate that uh, that question, uh, Dr. Dave. Do you have any technical stuff on sort of the human brain there? Or? Uh, actually, not so much about the neurology, but about being overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed is when our resources are breached. Uh, they, they, when the responsibilities are in excess of our resources. And that's where collaboration really plays because uh, we all get overwhelmed because we're all individually limited and subsequently operating in teams, understanding uh, your complements within that team and activating them really reduces our sense of real and perceived threats because we're better able to engage them. So in the end, it's all about the relationships internally so that we can service the relationships uh, that we call customers externally. Sure. Excellent. Um, so, okay, so appreciate the, uh, the, the responses here. And, and part of the reason I like to, uh, to ask this question is that, um, that people are in different places. And I think it's really important for us to, uh, to stop and have that recognition that uh, not everybody's in the same place. Um, some of us, and actually the CEO this morning that we were talking to, he actually sort of made reference to this, that he has personal beliefs about mask wearing or not mask wearing. Um, but as a leader, right, it, he felt that it was very important in his organization that he leads by example. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's, uh, it's about the, you know, what, it's not what I say, but it's what I do. That, uh, that people are going to observe the most. And, and so I think it's really important for all of us to sort of take a step back when we're feeling anxiety or when we're concerned or when we're thinking about the different stakeholders in our lives to sort of recognize we have some bimodal distributions here. We have some, some of you are saying your employees were not very impacted. Um, there's other people who, are, um, who have answered this at a five, right? You can kind of see the curves here. That uh, so some of the folks on the call, you feel you're, 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 you've had a huge impact on your employees and others are saying not so much. And some of you are saying, myself, I've had a huge impact or others are saying not so much. And I, I think especially when we see this kinetic anxiety that uh, Dr. Dave talked about earlier, that in the polarization of some things happening in our society, that we sort of recognize this and appreciate it 
And as a leader, we make certain decisions based on the understanding that not everybody's in the same place that we are, and not everybody's in uh, even in the same place as each other in terms of impact and in terms of uh, reaction to it. So we'll, uh, we'll move into a, another question here. Uh, which are you most concerned about disrupting your, uh, your business today? So this one's a little prioritization. Uh, you can move the, uh, the, the comments or the uh, answers there. You can move the ones to the top that are uh, the highest priority or highest impact. Uh, Dr. Dave, you have any other comments on the on the previous one? No, I, I think we're good. We just uh, we really well. I, okay, the, the one comment I have is uh, we are all looking forward to just getting back to our relationships. Uh, I noted uh, previous slide: family, vacations, uh, connecting. Uh, this disruption has uh, resulted in the recommendation of not connecting, and I thought, well, that's going to just can create all kinds of problems for, for a lot of different people because human beings are designed to be connected. So stay connected in whatever fashion we can. That would be my one comment. Great, uh, great comments. Yeah, I think I think that's really uh, an important uh, important part of it. And I think you know, looking back, you know, at sort of at the beginning of everything, people were all excited about Zoom and about you know. Uh, we, we had a weekly family game night with my with my parents, right? Um, I think it was important to stay connected through all of that and uh, and to make sure we stayed communicating. But there certainly has, you know, to some extent been been some uh, been some burnout and been you know been some uh, uh, challenges with some of the virtual stuff. I think going back to the first question we asked about, uh, you know, how what are you most looking forward to, and um, you know getting haircuts and, and going out to eat and things are, uh, are, are pretty important to all of us. But I think that human connection becomes really important and uh, um, really an important part of what we're doing. So, uh, so here we'll look at some of the responses here, some of the answers. So uh, some of the top things that folks are concerned about disrupting business today. So some of the priorities, some of the things you have on your mind, uh, changing market conditions, and I, I think this goes along with, uh, with some of what I said earlier, but uh, some of you may be experiencing it in different ways. Uh, but the, the comments in the, that I'm hearing from the packaging industry are that things like prepackaged foods have, have, been, uh, have been great sellers in the supermarkets. Um, things like produce on the outside of the, uh, of the shopping experience, the op outside of the supermarket, uh, have kind of been struggling in the supermarket industry because uh, people are looking at and uh, thinking about these farm to table type things. So I, I see some opportunities growing there. Uh, Crane's Chicago business had a, uh, an article on it just last week about um, how some of these organizations are on fire, right? They're, they're, they're going crazy. And uh, so it's, it's really going back to fight, flight, or freeze. Um, how are you adapting your business to, uh, to meet those changing market conditions. And then loss of key personnel, I think is an important one. The, uh, the things we're seeing in terms of personnel and, and the uh, dynamics there are uh, really, really um, top of mind for folks. And then safety and security. I think that's, uh, that's been a common theme as well. Um, and uh, not, not just physical security from the sense that I wanna keep people out of my plant, or, but, but also sort of the health uh, dimension of that. Any other questions popping up, Ron, as we go, or we'll kind of put one more uh, one more question oh, right up here. Now we're good. All right, we'll put one more question up here to kind of think about um, your organization's strengths in the uh, in the following areas. So, um, if you sort of think about your organization in terms of uh, your purpose, your vision, uh, who you are as an organization, the uh, the people that are in your organization. Um, the process that you have or or the performance that you're getting out of what you're trying to do. Um, if you sort of rank those from, you have opportunities to improve to, uh, to very strong, it'd uh, be interesting to see. I'd be curious to ask the audience, what problems are you incurring directly? 
and what have you tried that's been effective or ineffective? The ineffective ones aren't necessarily bad, they're opportunities to, to learn, but I'd be curious as to what comments our audience might have regarding those two questions. Yeah, excellent question. So folks can uh, put that in the chat box and, um, and see if we get some comments on that. Uh, so excellent. So, so, uh, so kind of thinking about those four dimensions that uh, we talked about early on in this, the purpose, people, process, and performance, um, you know, that, that equation is really, um, you know, those, that, the way those three things link together, the purpose, people, and process, is, uh, is really what can drive you to a higher performance. And if we sort of think about that Rosie the Riveter example, um, where they were making you know tens of thousands of munitions a day and they wanted to get to hundreds of thousands or millions um, there was a clear purpose and uh, and they were able to motivate and incentivize people around that um, the people who came into the workforce got uh, um, were coming in and understanding that purpose they linked to it and uh, and finally the process how do you onboard folks how do you get them involved in the process a, a, big thing that comes out of training within industry was uh, was how to train people in technical and non-technical jobs very efficiently and effectively. And that's a, a core part of um, some of the modernization we did around that to, uh, to help organizations that need to scale up quickly or scale down quickly. How do you, uh, how do you adapt your organization and how do you, uh, how do you sort of move forward? So I'll leave you with a couple of closing thoughts as we come up close to an hour here. Um, this is actually a, a, a quote that's on a mug in one of my uh, one of my clients here in the Chicagoland area. Um, Lindsay has this mug on her desk that says, "People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care." And uh, I think it's really important for uh, everyone who's on this call, for everyone who's in, involved in uh, in business leadership and packaging to. Um, and even working with the brands that you work with. Um, the brands are really about messaging and trying to connect emotionally with, uh, with their customers. And, uh, and they often do that through packaging. And I think that's a, a really important element of, uh, of the packaging world. Um, but, but keep that in mind. I think it's as relevant today, if not more relevant than it was uh, when, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt said it. So we'll leave you with a uh, with a couple of next steps. I know uh, Ron mentioned he's going to they're going to be sending out a follow up survey. Um, he's asked me to put together a more in depth workshop. Um, so we're going to ask you a couple of things around uh, which workshop you'd be most interested in. We've got a couple of options around prioritization and around uh, the uh, how to improve and instruct your employees in a better way to uh, to get them more effective and efficiently. Um, but the next steps we'll kind of leave you with today are to uh, to connect. So we'd encourage you to reach out, send us send me an email if you'd like, and uh, love to connect with you and talk with you more about where your organization is at and um, and what challenges you're facing or or how you know how we can be of uh, assistance in that. The second is to clarify and prioritize. So uh, we've got some prioritization templates, and but it's not just about a template. There's a there's a process there, and um, and using things like Mentimeter in a way that's neutral for your employees, you can do it in a staff meeting. And uh, and most people have smartphones; they can get out and answer a few questions. Some of those people who are quiet, um, we need their voices to be heard. We need to uh, to clarify what challenges our our employees, suppliers, customers are feeling, and uh, and to engage with our teams. And finally, create value. Um, I encourage you to uh, to think about the value you can create for your customers, employees, family, faith, your communities. Um, what what value can you create, and how can you um, how can you engage um, the the stakeholders who are important in your life? Uh, this is this is this is really important in times like this, and uh, and so I'd encourage all of you to do that. And um, we sincerely welcome your feedback about the uh, the webinar and what those future workshops might look like, where we get into some more technical detail to, to help you facilitate. So any other questions, Ron, as we, uh, as we wrap up here? No, we don't have any other questions. And I want to thank both you and Dr. Dave. So Ron and Dr. Dave, thank you very much for your 
uh, assistance today and going through this is very interesting. And we'll look at the follow-up and hopefully uh, we'll get some folks to be interested in the follow-up uh, workshops and some of the other things we, we have planned. So thank you guys. Thank you all of you who've been on the call today. It's been great. Um, and uh, take care and stay safe as we like to say these days, right? So everybody be well. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, guys. Thank you.